Greetings, Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel and uh, UCSD, Department of Neurosciences. I'm very pleased today to be with Irene Litvin. Dr. Litvin is professor of neurosciences at UCSD and uh, a world-renowned figure in movement disorders, an expert that has a very powerful influence both nationally and internationally. Um, Irene, it's good to have you here. Thank I'm you, proud Leo. to have you here as part of our faculty. It, movement disorders are awfully important. They're the topic of a lot of discussion. Uh, give, give the listeners a sense of where we stand now with them generally and maybe pay some a little bit more attention to Parkinson's disease. Uh, what are you thinking? What's, where's the field right now? So movement disorders could be defined as impairments in the movements, either excess of movements or decrease of movements. And Parkinson's would fit in into those that are having less movements. But that is kind of an old definition. We have uh, seen a lot of changes in the field that actually are very exciting, particularly the fact that now we have that clinical, pathological, and even pathogenesis seem to be fitting together and that we are starting to understand how the disease starts and how it starts to progress. And the motor aspects actually are not the first symptoms. Mm -hmm. And that I think is what is more fascinating. So the first symptoms are in fact problems with sleep, enacting the sleeps, what we call REM behavior disorder. Another problem is the lack of smell uh, that, of course, it can occur with many things. It can occur also if you're a smoker or you have allergies. But here, the thing is that many of the symptoms that I'm mentioning, putting in them together, is what we would say it is what is called the prodrome of Parkinson's disease, the symptoms that occur before the actual motor symptoms. And that also includes depression and includes constipation and may include even some changes in executive functioning. So all those are features that are extremely important and may occur 5, 10, 15 years before the actual motor symptoms. So when people think about Parkinson's disease, they think about people who have trouble moving. But you're saying, in fact, that there are a lot of different kinds of neurons involved and the movement, comes, the movement change comes late. So how does one explain that? I mean, what's the thinking about how this disease emerges in someone? What, what, where are we with that kind of thinking? Well, I think that there is a very interesting hypothesis, the dual uh, hypothesis of involvement of the um, GI system, gastrointestinal system, mm. as well as the olfactory bulb. And Brack and Brack did a wonderful job in trying to uh, show how the disease progresses from first being in the GI system, then perhaps going through the vagus nerve, then going to the brainstem to the uh, 10 and 11th uh, vagus uh, nerve uh, nuclei, and from there spreading um, all the way up. Uh, rostrally to involve in a perhaps third stage um, the substantia nigra. So what we thought initially that was the first uh, area that was involved, in fact it isn't. It is really something that occurs much later. And when we see a patient that has Parkinson's disease with the motor symptoms that we all recognize and we were taught in medical school, in fact, that patient may have the loss of 50% of the neurons in the substantia nigra and even 80% of the dopamine in the striatum. So we are diagnosing late mm. the disease. We're not really diagnosing it at early stages. Um, I guess this could equate in some ways to what happens with Alzheimer's disease, that there is also an earlier stage, the mild cognitive impairment, prior to the stage that is the Alzheimer's disease. And this would be the same idea. And the disease continues to actually go 
more rostrally and eventually involves the whole cortical areas leading to dementia. Not in everybody, but in a high percentage of the patients. Um, in fact, dementia is five times more frequent in Parkinson's disease than in the general population. So in the case of Alzheimer's disease, knowing that there were genes that, in, that are involved that cause it allowed investigators to really map out those early stages that, that you're sort of alluding to in Parkinson's disease. Have genetics helped us understand Parkinson's disease? Significantly. In fact, the, the um, finding of families that have alpha-synuclein mutations is what led to the initial discovery of alpha-synuclein being involved in Parkinson's disease and the development of techniques to actually not just look at, looking at the old structures that are the inclusions that have Lewy bodies, but also stains with alpha-synuclein that are more sensitive and allow us to understand much better, in fact, how the disease progresses. So if one focuses on that protein, because that protein is really able to be discovered as abnormal across the spectrum of Parkinson's disease, do we have a sense for how that protein normally acts and how it's different in Parkinson's disease? We do. We would, would like to know more, but we know that it has to, is involved in the synapses, and we know that this protein changes it, it forms and it falls in a different way, misfalls. And the interesting aspect of it is that as it misfalls, it gets, uh, I guess, aggregated with other proteins and, and forms what we call the oligonucleotides that are the ones that go from cell to cell and lead to the misfolding of the neuron that is uh, in touch with this neuron that was initially affected and leads to the transformation and misfolding of the protein that was completely normal before. So a, a collection of, of alpha-synuclein molecules in, a, in an oligomerin cell one communicates itself to cell two by spreading there. And then cell two is affected and it then sends that same a new cluster, a new protein, but the same conformation to cell three. So you have this progression, as you alluded to earlier, from the gastrointestinal tract to nerves that innervate the tract to the brainstem to the base of the brain where these dopaminergic neurons are and then more generally to cortex. It's a kind of progressive pathological spread of these abnormal proteins. Correct. So that's exciting. And, and so do we have technologies now that target this process? Yes. In fact, the, the most exciting part of it is, A, that I think that the clinical symptoms that we see that precede the motor symptoms um, are backed up by what we see pathologically, and that the way it spreads, it allows us to think that we can have now therapies that can trap mm -hmm. those oligonucleotides that go from cell to cell and would allow us to have therapies for these diseases. And I think the incredible thing is that, yes, we are having that. Mm. Um, it's been seen not only in animal models, but now there are uh, studies that are starting in humans in which antibodies are being used mm -hmm. to try to see if we can stop the progression of the disease. And this is the most exciting uh, thing that I have seen it's very uh, exciting. so far. So the idea is the antibodies would, would bind to those proteins that are being transferred from cell one to cell two, and if they can bind them and capture them and get rid of them, perhaps then one stops the disease. That's correct. Tell me about if I'm a patient with Parkinsonism in San Diego or if I have concerns about a loved one, how do I get help at UCSD? Well, uh, it is very easy and um, I think that one of the nice things is that over the last few years we were able to develop uh, 
Center of Excellence, a National Parkinson Foundation Center of Excellence. And this pretty much means that we are leading in uh, clinical care, we're leading in, in research, and also in education. And pretty much this defines what we do. We really want to uh, lead to uh, have patients having uh, wonderful care that is personalized and comprehensive, for which we have developed a whole team of uh, experts that are in different disciplines. So we can improve patients' speech, as we can improve the way they walk, as well as the neuropsychological aspects are being addressed and the psychiatric aspects are being addressed. And we can also allow these patients to be part of uh, clinical trials. So the nice part is that not only we have the basis for this comprehensive and personalized care, but also that we can provide the opportunity to be part of trials. And um, I hope we will have soon the possibility of patients to participate in anti treatments with antibodies against uh, alpha-synuclein, for example. This is one of the studies that we're considering to have. Mm. Um, we are having other studies as well in which other mechanisms are thought to be important that, that we are addressing as well. Um, because obviously this is one aspect, the one way of thinking on how the disease progresses, but there are other aspects that we need to consider as well. But in addition to, to that, I think that um, the, we are advancing science, we are providing the patient with a better quality of life, and in addition, we're training the next generation of physicians that I think it is uh, something that is also uh, something that is quite exciting and that we hope many of them will stay in our area and some of them have already which improves as well, not only ourselves, but also the other hospitals in, in our area. So I think that patients can just call uh, UCSD, the Movement Disorder Center, the Department of Neurology, and um, they can get an appointment, and we'll be glad to see them all. Great, and we'll provide you with the telephone number at the bottom of the screen so that you can call that number and, and get help. We're very proud of you and your Movement Disorder Center. Thank you for being with us on The Brain Channel. Thank you.